everyone and hello Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today for the latest patient perspectives as we take a look at the impact that genomics is having within patient lives. Today we are joined by former British ROA, Sarah Winkless. So Sarah, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, hello. Now I work in leadership and coaching, but a long time ago now it feels I went to my last Olympics in 2009. So I was lucky enough to represent Great Britain as part of Team GB in Sydney, Athens and Beijing. Since then, I've used my team skills, my development skills, my interest in psychology to help mostly corporate athletes work at their best. Um, I've also been chef de mission for Team England for the Commonwealth Games. So I taken some of my knowledge and looked at how to create the platform of performance for other athletes. It's been great fun, actually, loads of variety. Yeah. So as you kind of mentioned, you were kind of a former British rower, but you also kind of um, were the first woman to umpire the men's um, boat race. Why, why like boats? <laughs> what was the kind of <laughs> interest there and how did you kind of, what kind of drove you to that kind of career path? Yeah, Shannon, it's really interesting because we're meeting on Zoom and we're not standing side by side. And if we were standing by side by side, you realise I'm over six foot. So I <laughs> am a giant, I think. So I'm about six foot two. And as I was growing up, I was their second child. So I had a big brother to compete against. He was only 14 months old than me. My dad was um, a rower, actually, and, and very good at athletics and all sorts of things. My mum had been um, a dancer, so she had followed dancing. And so I grew up into this active family who encouraged me to be active. As a teenager, I kept away from the water. I didn't want to do what, what my dad and actually later my stepdad did. I wanted to forge my own path. So played netball, basketball, did athletics. And then I was lucky enough to have a place at Cambridge and that led me onto the water. I, I was offered a place in my college's rowing boat and at the time I'd just not qualified for Commonwealth Games as a discus thrower so my track and field and I was home for the summer and it gave me something different to do and I got myself in the boat, was absolutely rubbish, could not do it at all but every now and again something went right and that something that went right made me think oh, I'll just go back and try again. Oh, just go back and try again. And pretty quickly, I got more right than wrong or started to get better at it and I got addicted. Yeah. I mean, after your kind of rowing career, you, you, as you mentioned, you're kind of into more like a, of a leadership role. What kind of made you want to go into that? I think I'd learned so much as an individual contributor, if you like. So as an elite athlete, I was incredibly lucky. I started my elite sport in 97 and lottery funds had just come on board. So as I sort of went up the ranks, if you like, the system became more advanced, it became more developed and I was su surrounded by some world-class people who were supporting me to be at my best. And I learned loads and I wanted, I wanted to be able to share that knowledge. And if I'd become a coach, if I worked with one crew, of course you can only make so much difference in that way. So I, I wondered if I could, do some work for Team GB and make a difference to lots of athletes or the Commonwealth Games latterly. So it was about how could I quickly, because we're going to get on to why I, I am a patient, make, make changes and learn lots. So I created a portfolio. I was in my mid thirties and I wanted to basically find out where I was good in this new life and grow it and find out where I didn't fit and, and shrink it. So I I just said yes to lots and lots of things. And I had these three buckets. It was I earning, learning, or making a difference. And I probably shouldn't say them in that order. Cause I think in year one and two, I did an awful lot of learning. I think we all do. I was doing things for the first time, lots of the time. I was doing a lot of making a difference. I was very lucky to get lots of volunteer roles and be able to uh, make a difference to some of the things I'm passionate about. And every now and again, I'd look up and think, oh my God, I really need to earn something because I have to pay the bills. As you kind of, as you mentioned, you are obviously a, a patient and your, your family are affected um, by Huntington's um, disease. For those who kind of aren't, aren't familiar, would you, would you ever just kind of give people a brief overview of, of what Huntington's disease is? Yeah, Huntington's disease is a gene brain degenerative disease, hard to say to apparently today. And um, so of course, at the moment I'm, I have the gene, I'm well at the moment, I'm asymptomatic, but it affects you in the mood, memory and movement. So basically I, as a teenager, watched my mum 
change. So that beautiful dancer that has this amazing vibra vibration, but vibration about life. She was an extraordinary role model for me as a very young girl. She, she got a lot more moody. And in fact, I think she was probably depressed her movements changed because she was affected by Huntington's in that way. And actually for us, her memory was pretty good. It just took her a really long time to do things because there was a hole developing in her brain. Yeah. When did you kind of come become first aware that your mum was affected by the, by the condition? And did you have any sort of other family history of um, Huntington's? So I became aware mum was different in those teenage years, but we had no language. My, her doctor started to want to look down a path to see what was going on, but mum changed doctor. Um, she did other things to try and keep herself well. So I think she knew she wasn't well. So she got her mercury fillings taken out and had amalgam put in because she was talking about mercury poisoning her brain. And actually she stepped away from conventional medicine and became much more holistic and homeopathic in a search for staying well. So I knew she was different. I didn't really know she was ill. And it wasn't until I was doing my, um, my, my degree really, and we, I was doing an experiment in psychology and we were looking at the brain essentially. And you know, back in the day, there would be a patient with brain damage and you'd see a change in behavior and the neuroscientists of the day would be looking at the behavior and then sadly waiting to the patient dies. I'm sure we all know, cut it up and they'd find out where, where the holes in the brain were or the da brain damage was. And I was listening to these lectures at a level that was just horrific. I, I, I mean, one, it was fascinating. I absolutely am fascinated by the brain, but I was also mapping these spaces onto the things my mum could no longer do. And I, I, I was pretty clear that there was something wrong with her brain. It wasn't that she was just different. It was, yeah, there was something going on there. And it was at the end of that first year at university was we heard the word Huntingdon's for the first time. Oh, maybe I heard the words Huntingdon's for the first time because actually like so many families, I think I'd heard it before. I think I'd heard it behind closed doors. There was this familiar echo when I started to hear it. And when I look at my photos of my grandfather, my mum's dad, he, he was ill with Huntington's. You can see it because if you know the disease and how people move, how they hold themselves, you can see that was there in my granddad. And so what I suspect was it was a hidden disease in my family and whether mum knew or not. And bizarrely, she worked for Max Perutz, who was the guy who discovered the gene for Huntington's in her early career before she stopped working to have children. So it certainly was a, a disease that my family was dancing around. She was dancing around before we understood that she had it. And for me, when I learned she had it, it was like the scales coming off my eyes. Knowledge was potential power for me. And I was able to understand more about the disease. I was able to understand what was the risk for me and my three siblings, because it's a um, genetically inherited 50-50 chance. But also I was able to repair my relationship with my mother because that relationship through those teenage years had become quite difficult, quite fragmented, definitely very, very spi spi spiky and sparky. And I was able to separate that, my mum and the disease and be able to, to walk alongside with both. So it, for me, it was a really repairing thing. Yeah. What kind of then made you want to, to get tested for the Huntington gene? I think it's that line, isn't it? Knowledge is potential power. I was pretty young. I was in my early 20s, my first year at university. And I was at Cambridge and the Brain Repair Centre was just down the road. And I thought, well, why not? I, I, for me, at the time and now, actually, being positive felt no, as in having the gene, felt no worse than being at risk. And I thought by genetic testing, I, I know, I can know where, where I am, am with it. And knowledge was potential power and it allowed me to make choices. So I, I waited the six months that I needed to. I went through the genetic counselling with a wonderful Anne Kershaw, who um, was being my genetic counsellor at the time in the brain at Huntington's, um, sorry, at the Cambridge um, Adam books and 
yeah, I went through that process and it, it was a really, really positive process. I was ready to hear the result. And of course, when I sat in that, um, it was face to face, that meeting, it, it was an incredibly difficult conversation because Anne was having to give me the news that I, I didn't want to hear. I don't think anyone wants to hear that you do have the gene. You want to hear that you haven't. Yeah. How did you kind of juggle receiving that diagnosis, like being, being so young and, and being at university when it's such a difficult time, like yeah. in, its, in itself? I think it probably helped me. I was really, really busy. I was doing my degree and I had to get on with that if I was going to pass that. I also had my sport. So by this point, I was doing rowing. I was also playing basketball and still doing my athletics. So, and I'd had a, met an amazing group of friends who were very supportive of me. So whilst I'm not going to pretend there weren't some wobbles and some rather large nights out with um, some rather messy ends, which... Yeah, I guess happens in every university's student's life. But I think when you're processing that information, I was probably more vulnerable and I was tired and had had a couple of drinks. And um, so I think I, I just rode the, that, that rocky road and there were many more good days than there were bad days. Um, I remember one particular day and I was doing my sport and it started to hurt and you know sport does hurt you if you're going to do it be an elite athlete you push your body to pain and uh, it started to hurt and my brain went into that oh poor me um, I've got Huntingdon's and I stopped I stopped on the rowing machine and I remember my coach just looking at me going Sarah what's wrong why have you stopped and I went I've got Huntingdon's and he he went not today you haven't get back on and I looked at him and I thought, oh, I hate you, but you're right. And I was very lucky because I was surrounded by people who knew when to give me a hug. And Ian Dryden, who gave me that comment, is one of my greatest friends today. But they also knew when to give me a kick. And that's what I needed that day. I, I didn't have Huntington's today. I don't, then, I don't have Huntington's today. Um, I have the gene. And I think being able to keep it in its box when I need to um, really, really did help me. Yeah. You mentioned that you obviously you have siblings as well. Like, what was it like for you kind of knowing that you were the one that kind of had, had the gene? Um, yeah. How did you kind of cope, cope with that? It's a really good question because when you've got siblings and we're incredibly close as a family, we're very lucky that we're close. My brother is 14 months older than me and then mum remarried and I have a little brother and sister that I have been part mum to and part sister because of the complexity of a caring caring family or family when you're caring for someone who's ill and I genuinely think Shan that for me I was always grateful that I if any one of us was going to have it I wanted it to be me I wanted to deal with it and not have them have to and I watched them go through their testing as they now have all been tested. And with each good news, it was um, a celebration. It was a celebration and I was absolutely delighted for them. I think when my final sibling got tested, I had another sort of wobble, which I didn't expect. It was a sort of hit me from a side, oh, poor, poor me moment, because there was that moment that I was the only one I was different from my siblings and actually I was lucky enough that my sports psychologist had worked with me not on me when I was um, an elite athlete and they taught me a lot about psychology and how I could control my thinking and I managed to shift my thinking from I'm the only one to three out of four we've beaten the odds and that absolutely transformed how I felt about their results. So I knew when I was looking each one of them in the face, I wanted their, their news to be the news it was. And then I see the three of them and there was that short, dark period when I really struggled, struggled with that. And it, I was quite old by then. It was a really real surprise because I'd known my news for a long time. What kind of support did you, did you receive after you got your diagnosis? So at, kind of at that time, but also what support have you received since, since then and like continue to receive? Yeah, I think critically, I mean, Anne Kershaw and the Brain Repair Centre at Edinburgh were phenomenal. They, um, 
I went and I've, I've, I was able to go and join some of their studies, so PREDICT and some of the studies that you may have heard about to, to monitor Huntington's patients and suddenly you're in a community and they're, they're checking in on you as well as um, using you as a, a lab rat if you like. A couple of weeks after the diagnosis, Anne, Anne phoned me up. She went for, left a message on my um, answer phone. I, I was lucky enough to have a phone in my room at university and she was able, able to do that. And actually years later, when she retired, she sent me an email and just went, you know, I'm retiring now, but um, I'm delighted to know that you're still well. So I've had these amazing individuals who have cared about you. And I think that's as a... Huntington's family, we see that happening because people who work with our community tend to work with us for an awful long time because of the family units, I think, and because you hopefully can follow people longitudinally. So I think being part of the studies has really, really helped me. The community have helped me. So I'm patron of the Scottish Huntington's Association, which sounds very grand title, but actually what it is, is a family of um, people who have got the same disease and we're able to work together through some of the, the emotions that inevitably you, you go through. So the charities have really helped me and actually some of the researchers, um, I've become uh, again lucky enough to stand on stages every now and again and be able to speak to some of the researchers and through the conversations I've had with them, friendships have grown and, and just the excitement when they think they're coming near a breakthrough and that they, they hope that they're going to or intend to make a difference to the community is palpable and you know what an amazing dedicated group of people they are. What, what made you want to become a, a patient advocate and kind of help raise awareness and how do you feel like your kind of platform has, has helped you do that? I think Shannon like other things it was not planned. I I, we had a campaign in Parliament a little while ago, Hidden No More, that was about HD and bringing it out and hide it and bringing out the family secrets. And you know, my family, I, I've shared earlier, was one with our with our secrets. And you know, when I was competing at elite level, I didn't nearly really tell that many people. People knew because I didn't hide it, but I didn't have the conversation. So I I remember when I got the option to be a patient advocate and actually I'd had a fantastic day at the office on an elite athlete I uh, won some competition and the journalists all wanted to talk to me and I'd managed to manage these interviews pretty well and I was talking to my coach afterwards and my coach said oh everything went well apart from this one question that Kathy would ask me and Kathy said my coach is shaking his head and I'm thinking I don't know why he's shaking his head but I'll continue so Kathy asked me about where was mum and I didn't know how to answer that question why wasn't she here supporting or was she watching at home and of course by that point mum wasn't that well and she might have been watching home but I didn't know if she was understanding it and my coach was shaking his head because Kathy Wood was standing on my left shoulder and listening to this and Kathy said to me why did I ask something wrong I said, no, Kathy, but, but mum, mum's not well. Um, and so it was a difficult for me to answer. And actually through that conversation with Kathy, I was able to do a large article in the Daily Mail. I was able to the first time share with the Globe, I suppose, anyone who was watching the Daily Mail, my Huntington status. And it was an interesting choice because I remember talking to my partner at the time and I said, oh, you know, I, I'm thinking of doing this. I talked to my dad, I talked to my siblings and I talked to my partner. So I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? And you went, well, You've never told me that you've actually got Huntington's. I mean, I know, but you haven't had that conversation with me. And I thought, oh, because I wasn't, it, 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 it's a difficult, when do you have that conversation? And I thought, well, I'll never have to have that conversation with a partner again. Oh, no. Um, so I made that choice. At the time, I did it once, and then I didn't do it much more for a few years. I got on with my elite sporting career. And then when I retired and I was, in that earning, learning and making a difference period, I really felt I could make a difference. I had an Olympic medal behind my, um, in my bag, if you like, I'd been world champion. I had a platform and I could talk for my, about my journey and, and my experience. And I, I really genuinely hoped it, it might make a difference doing that. It was, it was recently Huntington's um, Aware Awareness Month and there was a campaign launch called Family Matters. Would you be able to kind of discuss that a little bit more and, and how you got involved in that? 
Yeah, it felt incredibly important to keep um, making sure that Huntington's comes out of the closet, if you like, people understand it more. It is a rare disease, which is a fantastic state for it because there's not lots of people who do have it. But for us, it really does go through families. We see isolation being incredibly challenging for families, secrecy being incredibly challenging for families. And we really wanted to do a campaign where people could tell their stories. So Family Matters was about creating some videos and sharing some of the Huntingdon's stories. And the four videos that we did, I mean, I wept my way through them. They were um, extraordinary because they were funny, they were touching, and they shared different stories about family. We also had a, a living wall where people could share their own stories, contribute in, in their way. And it was basically the aim of the campaign was to raise awareness so that more people would understand what Huntington's might be. If they saw a Huntington's patient who was either slurring their words or not able to move instead of assuming they were drunk or on drugs, they might think, oh, I wonder what's going on there. They might have something neurological going on. So that was the aim of the campaign. But the secondary piece was it really did bring the community together. It was a, another opportunity for us to stand side by side and just share our perspectives. What has it kind of been like um, being in this community and watching the effects of kind of the pandemic and how has that impacted the community and also the kind of research side as well? Well, the pandemic, first and foremost, um, Huntingdon's families tend to be challenging places. You've got young carers in there, you've got someone with the disease, you've got partners caring for their loved ones. You know, it's intergenerational. So we, we do see some massive challenges. And of course, many of our most ill patients are on care homes. So first of all, there was that isolation piece, the fear of what was going on in care homes in this country. And also, you just simply couldn't get to your relative. And that is incredibly difficult for families and then there was no respite so um, usually a young carer might get to go to school usually in the Scottish Huntington Association we try and do some summer camps and make sure there's some bits where they can just be young people none of that could happen this year and then there was the isolation so the bit where we try and really bring the community together you simply couldn't do that so for me, I was incredibly concerned about our families and then making sure that I, I would do anything I could to reach out and just touch base. And then with the research, we've been in this incredible, hopeful place um, with several um, studies going on and, and both of them actually failed at the end of the last sort of wave and the lockdown. So I think for some of our community and those patients who were on those trials, it's been incredibly difficult because that hope at the moment feels further away than it did do, or, or a, a, a more healthy, longer future feels, feels a little further away. And for the researchers, for the families, for the patients, um, I think that's been incredibly tough. Are there any sort of kind of promising projects or, or kind of research studies that are in the kind of pipeline that you're kind of thinking, is going to be quite positive or you're, you're looking forward to? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are, and there are multiple more. We are very, very lucky. One of my scientist friends calls it's the most curable, non-curable disease, if you like, and that there is deep understanding. And as I said, we were at this dawn of um, being able to perhaps have a prophylactic. It wasn't a cure, but it was to keep people well. But there are other pieces. So gene silencing would be a keen thing that we might be seeing. And of course, there are new studies all the time. I'm, I wouldn't be able to say which one I think is the most successful, but we are very lucky that it's, it's a reasonably simple disease. They understand what it is that is making people ill. And so hopefully if they can create an intervention early enough, um, Huntington's sufferers won't, will be a thing of a past. In your, in your day-to-day -day life, how is this kind of diagnosis affected you and kind of like impacted your, your mental health as well because I suppose with Huntington's disease it's kind of a you don't know when yeah. like it, it, it will kind of impact you and what has that kind of been been like for you and how do you deal with that? I think in my when I was an elite athlete I lived my life in four-year cycles and that gave me 
great comfort. You know, if I was able to compete at world-class level, clearly I was well. And what I didn't notice that was when I retired, I kind of chopped my life into four year cycles again. But I think on a day to day basis, it gives me an excuse to stay well and prioritize myself. I, I know I have um, my brain probably is already challenged by the genetics that I have. So if I can sleep well, eat well, exercise well, things that actually we all could and should be doing. I'm likely to stay well longer. And that gives me a great excuse to prioritize myself, be properly selfish when I know that could be really hard, especially when there's lots of other things going around. Um, I also do talk about it. It's not something I talk about every day, but I will share my hunting story, my thinking when I'm working with teams, um, sometimes just to really talk about what a high performing team can look like. I really do consider my family to be the most important high performing team I'm part of no one's going to give us an Olympic medal but um or and you know we we've made it work and I'm incredibly incredibly proud of that and I bring that sometimes into the corporate world just to help people think about things differently so it's something I've tried to use um for my for a positive I suppose it's not something I can change so I make it part of me rather than, than hide it and I suppose I'm doing my bit uh, uh, making sure that more people know about what Huntington's is just through telling my story. What would the kind of one message be that you would, that you would um, give to um, patients or families affected by Huntington's? Find the community. Don't struggle on your own. It's, um, I watched my stepdad and he's the most incredibly strong guy and he didn't use the Huntington's community. It might not be the Huntington's community that you want to need. He found a different community, a, an amazing group of friends from, from the rowing community to, to support him. Um, but find, find your people and, and ask for help because it's a, it is a long road. It's a marathon and, and it's not a sprint. And the thing we learned with, with Mama and that I hope I hold is keep humor. The, the families that I, I see if we can find, you know, find find the, the difficult moments when you can look back at them funny rather than, than sad, it, it definitely does help. Thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. It's been, it's been really great listening to your story. It is, it's really, really inspirational as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video then make sure you check out some of the other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website for onlinegenomics.com. I hope you enjoy.